Each season, new fashions hit the runway, and variations of these pieces quickly work their way into the social media scene, pushing people to buy the newest trend. It's a vicious cycle of consumerism, as many of these styles are short-lived and lose steam in a matter of months. But within this cycle, there are some designs that have withstood the test of time. From classic trench coats to black stiletto heels, these styles transcend across different cultures and generations. So, how did these pieces manage to stay in the limelight for so long, and why are some fashion crazes, on the other hand, so short-lived? I would say that the sort of cycle of trends has definitely sped up quite a lot over kind of the last 10 years. I mean, I guess with the rise of digital culture and how everything is very much very immediate now, whereas maybe sort of 20 years ago, trends were slower because they came from the catwalk or the street and they sort of dripped down to what most people wore. That's Lauren Cochran, the author of The Ten, How and Why We Wear the Fashion Classics. Cochran has been a writer in the fashion industry since the early 2000s, working at London Vogue and now at The Guardian as a senior fashion writer. As you can probably imagine, working at a newspaper on the fashion desk, it can be everything from someone's lucky tie. I wrote something about the England's manager's lucky tie, which didn't turn out to be very lucky at all, <laughs> to the kind of rise of grey hair on the red carpets. It's very varied. In her book, Cochrane shares the long history of various fashions and how they've managed to stay current for so long. One of these trends is the little black dress, or LBD. This style first became popular thanks to Coco Chanel in 1926. The little black dress before, or black dresses in general, before she kind of put them in one of her collections, were seen, they had lots of different connotations. They were, as we still see them now, they were part of mourning. But also, particularly in the States, I think, they were seen as very dowdy because they were kind of essentially the uniform for shop girls. So for sort of young working class women. And Chanel sort of noticed this very sort of austere dress I think she saw them as part, of, which we still have today, they're as part of what maids wore in hotels. And so she always has had an eye for kind of taking something and giving it a kind of high fashion makeover, basically. Although radical at the time, the style of the little black dress quickly became a staple in fashion because it catered to a wide variety of consumers and budgets. It's a very diverse item, even if at the base of it, it's quite simple. So you can have them in all sorts of different like shape, sizes, lengths, you know, styles. So, I mean, I must have about 10 little black dresses and they're all kind of hugely different. Cochran notes that the versatility of this style was seen in older advertisements and films. Take Audrey Hepburn in Breakfast at Tiffany's, for instance. Hepburn is elegant and chic, wearing a classic black dress and oversized pearl necklace, and she nibbles on a croissant and coffee. This portrayal in the film only furthered the popularity of the dress for decades to come. Even today, the LBD is a key feature in many modern wardrobes, and that's the beauty of the piece. It's easily adaptable. I talk about in the book about how you could actually have a kind of wardrobe of little black dresses because the same little black dress doesn't work for different occasions. So you might have one that you wear to go out for a night, or you might have one that is kind of a good kind of fail safe for a kind of difficult day at work. They have a kind of forever appeal, I think. Apart from high fashion, other producers within the industry created more casual pieces that left a similar lasting impact. These items, like a classic pair of relaxed denim jeans and a well-fitting white t-shirt, have been around for centuries. Take the introduction of the classic tee, for instance. The sort of roots of the white t-shirt are kind of in underwear, so there have been kind of t-shaped clothing from the medieval times that people would wear underneath their clothes to kind of as a sort of hygiene thing so they didn't have to um, wash the kind of ornate items they wore over the top. The white t-shirt was first worn as a plain undergarment early on but quickly evolved into a larger statement as it gained mainstream popularity in the 20th century. Those t-shirts became kind of something more like we would recognize. The first kind of fashion moment for them was in the 50s when they became a kind of favoured item of kind of young men, a sort of new generation of young male teenagers who saw them on their kind of icons like Sidney Poitier and Marlon Brando and James Dean. And because, again, they have a kind of subversiveness 
at that time because for their parents, for those kids' parents, that white T-shirt would have been seen as underwear. So for them to wear it out the house sort of by itself would have kind of raised eyebrows, which no doubt they were keen to do. And today it takes on different forms. Some people wear white T-shirts with slogans and artwork as a way to communicate a message they believe in or live by. You can just wear a blank one or you can sort of wear one with exactly like a political statement on it or the logo of your favorite band. And what that does is it's very much the sort of the most like direct way that fashion tells sort of passers by what you're interested in, who you are. I think all clothes do that all the time, but T-shirts with statements is the kind of most like direct way to do that. And people often pair their T-shirts with their favorite jeans. Did they know that the first pair was invented in 1873 by Levi Strauss and Company? They were originally created as durable pants for working men. However, Cochran says that the T-shirt and jean look became a larger part of fashion culture in the 50s when younger people started wearing them and never stopped. They're sort of just part of our sort of societal trends as much as kind of fashion trends. And I think as time went on, they just became so popular. And as people got older, they didn't stop wearing them. So it's a sort of something that people wear throughout their life. My dad, who's 73, still wears Levi's 501s, for example. They've just been taken up by generation after generation after generation, and everyone wears them. They say that on a given day, half the world's population is wearing jeans. Although there have been different iterations of the classic jean over the decades, Cochran says the design has stayed relatively the same. Some styles of Levi's are virtually identical to the originals from the 1880s. It's very striking as to how similar. I don't think they've got like a pair from 1873, which is when they were first painted it, but from like the 1880s, I think is the oldest one they've got. And if you see a picture of them, they look so similar to what we wear now. What's interesting, I guess, is that they were sort of a design classic from the get-go. Jeans, t-shirts, and little black dresses are only three of the 10 trends Cochran explores in her book. She also touches on the first champion hoodie made in the 1930s and the rise of the scandalous miniskirt in the 1960s. Each timeless piece within this collection is unique, but all have managed to capture the attention of people over several generations. To learn more about the history of fashion and our guest Lauren Cochran, check out the book The Ten, How and Why We Wear the Fashion Classics. You can also find more information and archives of past shows at viewpointsradio.org. The story originally aired in August 2021 and was written by associate producer Bridget Killian. Our executive producer is Amira Zaveri. Our studio manager is Jason Dickey. I'm Gary Price.